Appreciate all you all coming to hear me talk. Uh, this is a humbling experience because I'm typically not a public speaking type person. I'm not on social media, so to put to be in front of you all, for you all to give me this kind of time, I greatly appreciate that, and I don't want to take this for granted. So I say that to say, at any point while I'm talking, please just holler at me. I'm still I'm a I'm a coach just like you all. There's some the sums going to pop up and it might be coach said it again for me. There's no such thing as a bad question. We're all here to help each other because after this is done, I might talk to some of you all about what you're doing with your kids in high school or whatever level you all are because I've got two teenagers that are in high school sports right now trying to get them ready to play in college. So I appreciate you all's time. So now we talk about strength conditioning, doing more with less. Basically talking about strength conditioning with no budget or a limited budget. Understand that it's not about the money with what you all are doing in the weight room. Truthfully, you all see this is our facility. This is the end of our right, at the end of our walkway. We've got 14 platforms behind us. We've got kind of our bullpen, our rehab area. We've got two leg presses, two pitch sharks, a chest press machine, um, four glute ham machines, a leg curl, leg extension machine. So it's not like we're working with a lot, but what we hang our hat on is being able to make the most of what we have with what we have. All right. And so the other thing is, is fellas, truthfully, as long as you got a bar and plates, you got more than enough to be a successful program. All right. So now as we get going, I, I give you all this because in going on 20 years of coaching, this has been my, my journey. And what you learn as you go through all these different places, the exercises still stay the same. It's the players that you deal with and, the, and unfortunately the administrators you deal with that make the jobs what they are. So when we talk about money and the perfect situation, fellas, there's no such thing as a perfect job. Understand, I've been a head guy on the FCS level at two black colleges, been an assistant at two power five schools, head guy at two mid-majors, in an NFL, been an assistant in NFL, and head guy in the NFL. It's about the people that you work with, the athletes that you deal with that maximize your program. Not the money, not the budget, but understanding what you're trying to get accomplished. All right, so before we get going, I want to talk about my staff because these are the people that really helped me become the coach that I am. On the outside, that's my top assistant, Roderick Moore, my other assistant, Bobby Thomas, and this young lady here, Tessa Grossman, came to us as a minority, well, an intern during the uh, Bill Walsh Minority Clinic. All right, she did a fantastic job for us, and for her, she was just seeking knowledge, but at the same time, she's seeking validation because to be a female strength coach, coach in football is one of those things that's starting to grow, but all of them understand and know what they're doing, but to be able to stand in front of a room with a bunch of alpha males, and truthfully, in our sector, when our players make three, four times as much as I make, then they can easily say, nah, coach, nah, I'm good today. But the relationships you build with them, the knowledge that you're able to share upon them and pour into them to help them understand why you're doing what you're doing is what makes the thing, makes our job what it is. So now, like I said, Roderick Moore was actually my, he was my coach in college. You know, so he's the one that really got me going down this journey because I played at the University of Tennessee and he told me, he was like, Star, have you ever thought about just being a strength coach? Because I was kind of like you all, guy that liked lifting. You know, I love playing ball, but just being around the game. And kudos, kudos to you all because as coaches, you all put in a lot more time than we do as strength conditioning coaches. I am not the person, I will say this uh, to, the, to the day I go, I am not the guy that can sit in front of film, rewind it, watch it, rewind it, watch I will fall asleep. I got to keep moving. So there's going to be some times I might move around in here. Trust me, that's the nature of me as a strength coach, why I wanted to be a strength coach. All right? So now, when we talk about this presentation, here's where we're going with this. And the reason I put this up here is because, like, how many defensive guys do we have in here? All right, so it's because I played linebacker, one of the things our coach always told us, a lineman assignment technique. If you do those three, three things on defense, you can probably be pretty good. Here's the same thing we're going with here. Our fundamental principles in training, all right? Secondly, our exercise selection and variation. And then I've got this last point, and I, when we get to it, I'll understand, you'll understand why I have highlighted strength and conditioning, all right? So now... This is one of the things that Coach Smith talks to our team about day after day after day. Champions are brilliant at the basics. At the end of the day, 
like you all's game, the game is 11 guys on the field, offense, defense, the field is what it is. Same thing as strength conditioning. The body can only move in so many different ways. You can only load the bar in so many different ways. So you want to make sure that you know what you're doing, but not only know what you're doing, but why you're doing it. Because what we know is that there's a million and one ways to get back to point A. But again, it's always going to bring you back to the basics. Uh, so I say that because John, we all know John Wooden was one of the most successful coaches in, in all of sports history. So if he can say that back at that time, the thing about history, it always repeats itself. We're the same way. We can learn to be brilliant at the basics and not have to worry about the shiny toys. And no disrespect to our sponsors, but all those shiny toys that are out there, when they're pulling on, let me get, let me get this business card, let me get this flyer. We know what kind of money we got, and sometimes, even in my position, when I go to these clinics, I put my head down and keep walking because I have to tell them, man, I, we don't have that kind of money. Even with that organization, we don't have that kind of money. So understand, as long as we, show, uh, we arm ourselves with the basics, then we can be extremely effective in what we're doing. Now, the other reason that this topic was really important to me, this was our COVID weight room, fellas. When we had the NF last year, when we got back on our COVID protocols and we could only have 15 people in a weight room at a time, we had to split our room so that we could maximize our time in the building. Because what happened with our NFL protocols, we couldn't have, we couldn't be in the building for long, but then even your workouts, when you're talking about 15 guys within training camp and a 90 man roster, you have to be efficient with your time. All of you all are coaches, you all want your time just like as strength coaches, we want our time. So again, when we're outside, this, you say I don't even have any two and a half. I had one bar, or I had one bar, and that's just a flat bench, not even an incline. But we're outside. We call. We end up. We we made it fun, but we call this the yard, basically like in prison. This we we gonna hit this iron, but this is how we gonna do it because we can still get something from it. Now on the other side of it was our other weight room, but when we were outside, this is what we had to work with. So this is not me just saying. Oh, some guys are going. Oh, he's just talking to talk. No. Fellas, this was last year and even going up to this year because as, co as we all know, it had to deal with COVID. It changed protocols week after week. So we went from a time where we could have a team in to now we, now we had to be at 18 guys. Well, then it became if you were vaccinated, you could have more guys. But if you, had, if you didn't have a vaccinated guy, he had to be separate. He had to be in them. Fellas, this thing was very real. So we, again, had to go back to the basics. So if we had somebody that, had, that was in a situation, Situation, unvaccinated, 15 got limit. We had to make do with what we had. And this was literally a real thing for the most part of our season. Now, when we talk about those three fundamental principles, that said principle, progressive overload and periodization. Fellas, if you arm yourselves with this and strength and conditioning, you can take care of so many things because what we're talking about with the said principle. Specific adaptation to imposed demands. Basically, what the, the wonderful thing about the human body, whatever you expose it to, it will respond to. So if you are just lifting heavy weights, guess what? You're going to naturally get stronger. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to build any work capacity. You might have bad technique, but as long as you're doing something, the body will respond to it. So make sure that you understand why you're doing what you're doing. All right? Secondly, when we talk about the needs and the demands of the sport, like I said, you all are football coaches. Some of you all have to do other sports. It should never be a situation where, and I get it, again, kudos to you all for the time and effort you all put into your sport. But understanding that if I'm a, if I'm a football coach having to work with football and whatever other sport, I owe that other sport the time and the due diligence to think about what the needs of their sport are. I could easily just copy and paste and change a couple reps, but that's not going to be the best for that athlete or for that team. So we have to understand what does that sport demand, all right? And when we talk about the demands of the sport, even within football, you've got different age ranges, and we'll talk about this later, but understand what the game requires because that will then dictate what you're doing, when you're doing it, how you're doing and then lastly, we talk about chronological age and training age. And this is a very big thing for you all in the, the basically the area that you all are in because you all have between 7th and 12th graders. And we say that loosely because now with reclassification, you might have some kids that are younger, 
but are now seventh grade, you might have some guys that are older than a true twelfth grader. So you have to understand that just because a person is at a certain point in their academic journey does not mean that training wise they are with they're ready to do what everybody else is doing. Prime example, these are my two kids. That's my ninth well, she's in eleventh grade, volleyball player, gymnast. That's my son, he's in the ninth grade, he plays baseball and football. Yes, they will work out together, but even in the midst of them working out, they're doing two different things because even though she is older than him, he has a higher training age because he wants to play sports in college. This one, she, I don't know. I, I'm just telling the truth. Like, she can go between volleyball, gymnastics, track. Like, she doesn't know what she wants to do, but she's blessed with good genes. So coaches always keep, come on, do this, do that. Anyway, all that being said, I have to handle them differently. And I get it. Some of you all, it might just be you and another two, and one, maybe two more coaches in the room. But you all have to understand and see the big picture of the room and the athletes you're dealing with because just because all of these athletes are in here doesn't mean that they all are capable of doing the same thing. So appreciate and take the time to give them the opportunity to develop slowly because if you just throw them in with the 10th graders, the 11th graders, or you might have an 11th grader who's just coming in from your school, coming to your school from another program where they didn't have strength conditioning. Guess what? He's probably got a low training age. So he can't do the same thing that the rest of your 11th graders have been doing that you've had and you know have been doing from, jump, from the time they entered you all's middle school program. Now this is our pro, um, pro progressive overload. Again, we talk about the body responding to the adaptations and the things that are given and stressed upon it. Prilipin's chart was designed by Alexander Prilipin. He was an Olympic, a Soviet Olympic lifting coach. Now, what, what this chart was originally intended for was Olympic lifters because as we know in Western countries where Olympic sports and Olympic lifting is very big, those athletes get, tra get started training roughly five, six years old. They're grooving motor, motor patterns because it, they're designated, okay, you're going to be this growing up. You're going to be that growing up. You're going to be this growing up. Well, for us in America, like we talking about my kids, we don't know what these kids are doing. And we also don't know what they're doing outside of our time, outside of the time with us. So we have to make sure that as we're working with these athletes, we progress in the right way. And so as we're talking about Prilipin's chart, it's not just a matter of a set, you know, throwing high volume on guys, four sets of 10, three sets of 12. Some of the things that I see on social media, and I say I, but as our strength staff, some of the stuff that we see on, on websites, high school programs, personal trainers trying to brag about what they're doing, they're actually doing more damage to their credibility as a coach than they are to help themselves and their athletes. Because there are some things when you talk about doing three sets of 15, three sets of 10, like a lot of volume can break down and hurt an, hurt an athlete. And we're talking about with you all's level of high school, and we know in high school there are different levels of high school ball. My Both of my kids go to Buford. 6, 6A, going to 7A, whatever it is, but I know that's high level in this state. I went to Lithonia High School in 1997, which was a 3A program. We had no strength and conditioning coach. So, all that being said, a 3A kid and a 6, 7A kid are going, probably going to be built completely different, so they have to be trained completely different. But as long as we arm ourselves with knowing how many sets and reps that these bodies can handle and we progress them the right way, then we know that we'll be able to get some type of progress. Because at the end of the day, that's all we're looking for. It's not about a magic formula that's going to make you bigger, faster, stronger overnight. These kids are with you for however long you may have them, one year, two years, five years, whatever. But as long as you all are handling them and training them, then you all know what they're doing. And so we can always remember our, our rep scheme and keep progressing as we're working with them. So now, the third thing, our periodization, and what, this is from our national organization. The definition, the process of organizing these various programming strategies and lining them with the targeted performance goals and timelines. And the reason that periodization is so important because if you're in the off season and if you're in the end season, two different training goals. 
And as we know that and we think about that, we can rely back on our prevalence chart to make sure that we're given our targeted goals, our targeted rep ranges, so that we can accomplish our goals. Because again, if these if they're not aligned, we're only increasing the risk of injury. We understand that strength condition is important. We understand that them developing physically is important. But we also know that them getting to you all on the field is the biggest thing. That's why you all get paid. So as strength coaches, we never want to have somebody get hurt in the weight room because that's the hardest conversation to have. Yeah, coaches, back went out doing, yeah, that, that, that never goes good. And heaven forbid it's one of your best players. Now I got a, co a cross on my head praying that I keep my job. So the same thing goes for you all, because even though you're a, a coach and you're the strength coach, that's going to be a hard conversation for you to have in a staff meeting that one of the players got hurt while you as a strength coach were doing what you thought was right. But if we continue to build upon and gradually progress, then we can ensure that the development is done in a safe and attackful manner. So now when we talk about periodization, this is ultimately what it looks like, a slow process. And strength and condi well, and even with us, when we talk about it from a practice standpoint, how we ramp our players up. You can't just throw your guys or your girls, your athletes into a workout not knowing what they had been doing. It's a slow process. And we can't, we, we will continue to emphasize the importance of a slow process because nothing is done overnight, especially when you're talking about strength and conditioning. But then even more so with the bodies that you all are dealing with, because you all know, you might have Johnny who is whatever size in ninth grade, he might come back and hit a growth spurt. Guess what? Even though he was strong at that size, now when you start talking about neuromuscular coordination and control, he's got to get used to a body at a different size. So we might have to start him back over, build him back up so he gets used to this new, this new body that he has. Or conversely, if you think about this in terms of grade levels, you can say at ninth grade, they only need to do so much. 10th grade, they need to do so much. 11th grade, they need to be able to do a little bit more. Because we see it plenty of times on social media again. People that are maxing out in high school, Right, wrong, or indifferent, I would say that is one of the worst things that ever happens because this kid is going to think, yeah, I can do this. Then the moment he gets to college and our hands, yeah, that probably ain't a real number. I mean, just telling you the truth. And now this kid is upset. He's going to come back looking at you all. Man, coach, you told me. No. Again, they're still learning how to do the exercise the right way. As they get stronger, yeah, it'll get better, but if they, get, if they understand the fundamentals of the exercise first, then we're able to make our significant jumps and continue to pro progress and get stronger. But again, we're talking about ramping things up. It doesn't have to be level 10 all the time. You'll see that we start at the lowest and build up. It didn't start at the highest and then build down. That's another story for another day, talking about practices. But it's very important that we understand the importance of ramping up with what we're doing. So now, exercise selection. And this is, the most this is another important conversation because everybody thinks you have to have this plethora of exercises, this long workout to be an effective workout. No, it is not about the time. It's about the intensity and the intent of what you're doing. And guess what? If you touch one of each one of these categories, you can have a very effective workout. And guess what? They'll be able to live, ha handle that to be able to see another workout the next day. So it's all about making sure that what you're doing, one, is not damaging too much on day one, but looking at the big picture of the entire week. Because you all do have the benefit of being able to train these athletes five days in a row. Four days, you know, four days if they're not playing special, or playing another sport. But just understanding that as long as I do a little every day with what I have, then I can get these players better. And then from there, as we get better with this, now we can look at progressing exercises and changing things up. Now, Again, I, I preface this whole presentation saying, as long as you got these things, fellas, you can be effective. And if nothing else, what COVID taught us, if you got these five things, you can still make an effective workout. And guess what? In a high school setting, I would be more inclined to start with these before we even touch a bar. 
Because most play, most athletes, high school players now, if we're completely honest, spend more time sitting on the phone, sitting down, not moving like a generation that we grew up in. So now when you put them under a bar, this is a different thing for them. But with a band, there's it's enough resistance that they feel a stimulus, but there's no danger in getting pinned or having a traumatic injury. So understand, as long as you got these, you can take this on the road and make money with this. Fellas, we sent workouts to players for during COVID, three sets of 12, three sets of 15, doing di those five categories with these to get guys through until they were able to get their own weight room. Was it effective for high-level athletes? Yes. So I know it can be effective for you all. But understand, it's not about the big picture, the shiny toys out there. It's about the basic things that have been around in strength conditioning for years. And when you talk about cheap and effective stuff, as high school coaches, you all, make, you all have the best budgets in America because it's what you donate. It's what you all are able to raise. If you can raise $10, $20, from one parent, you got enough bands. If you got raise fifty dollars from a parent, you got enough. And so, we're not talking about a hundred thousand dollar budget. You can get enough to outfit your whole team for roughly five hundred dollars, and have them training in a team setting. When we do joint practices, if we do in, in college, when we did bowl prep. We could come off a field right after practice, lead, drop your helmet, have a workout right there on the field without having to try to find a weight room, trying to manipulate coach's schedule to get somewhere else. All about with these, with these six tools right here. And now, again, once, we, once we're able to progress and, and handle these, then we can get to the bar. But understanding, you can get so much done with bands and body weight exercises that it's uh, you know it's all about your imagination. What can you come up with that that is safe but also progressive? Because what we never want to do is go chasing the exercise. Somebody did something that looks kind of one professional athlete did something kind of cool on social media. Let's try that. Well, one, how did they get there? Two, where are they going from there? But three, that's a high level athlete. Those guys need different things from time to time to mentally stay engaged. For the crowd that you all are dealing with, the basics will teach them exactly what they need to know from a training standpoint about learning how to work, but then understanding their body, about learning how to squat, how to press, how to hinge at the hip, how to hinge at the knee. Because again, sport is all about movement. If you can't move, for most of you all, you can't play. Now, some of, our tip, some of our things that we highlight with these exercises are our time under tension principles. And now, when we talk about time under tension, the body responds to tension in, a nu in numerous ways. Also, the way we look at it, a rep, is she can be up to seven seconds. One rep, seven seconds. The centric part of the exercise, the lowering is the most important part because that's where you get your muscle damage, that's where you get your muscle growth. So if we're doing four, three, five, seven second eccentrics, we're always going to count one second for a concentric movement, but we can do eccentric exercise with all of these bands and still get great work out of them. All right. And when we talk about time under tension, from a research standpoint, it's between, it takes between 40 and 60 seconds for your upper body to really respond. So when you see guys that get in there and rip out five, eight reps as fast as they could, did their bodies really get anything out of that? Now they got under the weight, but how much of that elicited a response from their body to be able to do something? But now that guy who's taking his time with the exercise, now he's actually firing muscles, recruiting muscle fibers to get something done. Again, these three th these things and that bar, nothing special. Time under tension. We can slow it down. We can do eccentric emphasis exercises. We can do isometric emphasis exercises. We can put a combination of eccentric and isometric tempos. But we can do a lot of things just from a time under tension standpoint. Then secondly, with our lower body, you're talking 60 to 90 seconds of work. Remember, your legs are your biggest, most powerful muscles in your body. So why not give them more time to work? 
Again, they're also the most important part of the sport because it's all about movement and the work capacity to be able to stay in shape. Working out is not just about how strong you can get. It's also about creating a work, a work capacity to be able to stress your heart to help enhance your conditioning effect on the field. So we want to make sure that when we're working, we're taking our time emphasizing our three things. All right, so in a squat, yes, sir, talk to me. At 30 or 60 seconds, you're talking about per rep? Yes. Okay. Yes. Sure. Yeah, and so, and that's why I say, well, no, not per rep, but per set. So, oh, set. yes, so we say seven seconds per rep, but 30 to 40 to 60 for upper body, 60 to 90 for lower body. So if you all think about traditionally, as high school coach, I know you all appreciate it, wall sits. The first thing you do is start at least at a minute because your body can handle that. Now you'll notice about a minute, about that 90 second mark, that's when you see them legs start to look a little shaky. But that's not that much stress on your body because all that is is an isometric contraction within the prescribed time based on scientific research. Fellas, I, and I use that doctor title, I'm, I thank God I got it, but the NFL is about science-based proven practices. So there'll be times that I will say to you all, based on research, not to show how smart I am, but when you're talking to pro athletes, that's what they respond to. They don't, oh, I, this is how we did in college, wrong. Well, this is how, because I told you, wrong. You better be validated and understand and thoroughly explain why you're doing what you're doing. So again, we're talking about the, the, the muscular contractions and the muscular actions you can do a combination of eccentric and isometric because there's always going to be a concentric portion. You always got to finish your return back to your start position. But the most muscular damage and most muscular growth is from eccentric exercises. The isometric, that's good for creating stability in a, in a, in a movement. So if I'm pausing at the bottom of a squat or if I'm pausing at the bottom of a bench, now guys are understanding what it means to set my shoulder blades, keep my arms at 45 degrees, and not let everything fly, flare out. It's all about teaching and exercising fundamentals. Lastly, we talk about the physiological and the psychological stresses. These create the physiological stresses. You all as coaches create the psychological stresses. And what I'm talking about with psychological stresses is simply that one athlete that's always coach watching, and you all know what I mean by coach watching. He's always cutting his eyes trying to see where you all are. Guess what? That's the guy I want to coach because I'm going to stand right here to make sure you do everything the right way the whole workout. That workout that he has to do with someone watching him is 10 times harder than what everybody else is doing. And it's the same workout, but because he has to be that much more diligent in everything that he's doing because you're not going to let it slide has gotten that much more intense. Did that cost you anything to coach that one guy that much harder? No. So that's not in your budget, but this is why you all coach. You want to make a difference somewhere. And guess what? That same kid is going to go inside. He's going to be wore out, and he's going to be telling his teammates, now you just had an impact in the entire locker room because nobody's going to want to be coached by coach such and such. No, nah, please keep moving. Please keep moving. Hope he don't stop. He stopped. God, dog. Okay. So you all create the psychological stresses, the demands that you all place on them. One of the things that I was taught when I was taught when I was a young coach as a GA, you either coach it to happen or you allow it to happen. Psychological stress. If I see a kid getting away with a bad rep and I let it happen, okay. I just he got he didn't get better. I didn't get better. Our program didn't get better. And you don't know who in your room saw that kid getting away with that. But if I coach that kid and then somebody else sees me getting on him, now that just heightened everybody else's intensity. That heightened everybody else's awareness to what's going on and the seriousness of what we're doing. Again, costs no money whatsoever. Now, we're here talking about strength and conditioning. Fellas, I cannot emphasize that conditioning part either. And that's why we got this picture of the scales of justice because they're both important. I get it. Some of you all might only have 45 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever it may be. But the body is meant to move. So there needs to be some type of conditioning or movement action every workout. If you only spend 15 minutes on a dynamic warm-up, you can make that as fast as you want to. You can make it slow and methodical and very meticulous. But there's some type of movement that needs to happen each and every day. Because if they don't do it with you, you're taking it for granted that, and hoping that they're going to do it on their own. 
And with the jobs and livelihoods that are on the line for all of us, never will I assume or trust an athlete to do something that I know is important to him that will also be uncomfortable. Secondly, we talk about linear speed and agility. Two different things, but very important to the overall scheme of athletics. Being able to run straight ahead is not as easy as people think. But it is very important to, to lower body injuries. So we're talking soft tissues, hamstrings, calves, quads, all of that stuff is very important. So you have to be able to run fast straight ahead. Doesn't have to be long because there's a difference between speed and conditioning. We'll touch on that. But being able to run fast is important. You all have to expose them to that as much as possible. However, not on the same day that you're doing agility or changing direction. That's important for your ankles, your groin, hips, again, soft tissue, but just being able to evaluate how guys move. How many guys, how many times have you all seen an athlete do a line touch here? Like, what? Like, they're, either they're going to roll that way, roll over that way, but there was no type of fluidity to that movement. So guess what? Cost nothing to slow that athlete down, teach him how to sink his hips, drop and put his, turn his foot so he gets all his spikes in the ground so he can propel himself in the right direction. Going back to the psychological stresses, it's on you all to coach the little things still. But we have to make sure we incorporate these things in our program. And then lastly, we talk about sport being movement. It doesn't have to, just because you're working with them in a strength conditioning element, doesn't mean it has them turn into an additional practice. You have to teach them how to move. We all knew what it was like to fall off of a fence, fall out of something, and learn how to protect ourselves. Some of these guys, and you watch film on concussion videos, so many concussions happen when people fall, don't know how to brace themselves. How hard does that cost anything to teach somebody how to fall? No. You got 100 by 53, 120 if you count the end zone, take them out there. Move them around. It doesn't always have to be restricted to the weight room. Take advantage of all your resources. So lastly, just want to conclude, say thank you all for everything. Remember, we talk about if you all arm yourself with the fundamental principles, you'll be good to go in everything that you do without any type of dollar amount. Again, there's no dollar amount that takes for you all to just coach your athletes and be good at the basics with what, what you're doing. Be smart about your exercises. You don't have to do everything in one day. It is a process. You have time. You have another day. Well, I say that loosely, but we pray for another day. Remember, you can build it up throughout the course of a week, a course of a month, a course of a year. Whatever it is, think about that. Don't try to overload them. And then lastly, strength and conditioning. Make sure that you all move them. Don't just keep them in the weight room, worried about the bench press, worried about the squat, worried about the power clean. Teach them how to jump. Teach them how to land. Teach them how to sprint. Teach them how to change directions. These things have to be taught. Because what you all do greatly affects what we do on a, on a collegiate level, even a professional level. All right? So I'll open up to the floor right now if anybody has any questions. Yes, sir? What are your thoughts on velocity-based training? In high school? Yes, sir. Wouldn't do it because they're all still learning how to move their body. They don't have the control. They don't have the neuromuscular control to know how to move fast in a safe manner yet. Now, a senior, maybe because they're, they're more mature physically, but as a freshman, a ninth grader, a 10th grader, their bodies, are still, their bodies are still adapting to the training stimulus. So they're not going to be able to move safely in a strong, in a, in a, in a, in a efficient manner because we're worried about the number. So, so would you say you're, it's a, a technique thing, maybe more worried about moving the walk fast versus fast with good technique at a, at a younger age versus the, high, the, the 12th grader? Yes, absolutely. Yes, great question. Anybody, another, I saw a hand over here. Yes. How do you get, especially with technology and social media and kids seeing, like you said, NFL players, but they also see people right down the street doing lifting weights, maxes. My question is, how do you get kids to buy into something so vastly important? It's, the one starts with the relationship understand and being able to just slow it down and talk to them to explain and and when I say explain they that 
10, 15, 20 second social media clip is just that. It's like the highlight tape. You don't know what else went into that. You don't know what else is after that. So just explaining to them that at the end of the day, as your coach, I have your best interest in mind. How we do our program here is going to be different than how they do their program there. But at the end of the day, I have your best interest in mind. So if I try to do with you what they're doing and you're not prepared for that, you've gotten hurt and you're going to look at me. Any other questions? Yes, sir. So as you, as you were stating earlier, you know, you've got the chronological age and then you got the training age. Yes. All right. So just say I'm going to give you a promise up in my weight room, we might have 25 to 30 kids. Yes. All right. So at a small school, I'm by myself. Yes. So how can I, like, my focus mostly, I'm mostly on the football kids. Yes. And I might have 12, 13 football kids, or uh, three to five basketball kids, or uh, seven to eight baseball kids, and then some, just some kids that's in there that's just going to work out. How do, how, how can you implement, you know what I'm saying, and run that weight room without having, I'm trying to see, Having my football kids do this, the baseball kids do this, the basketball kids do this, and the other kids doing something completely different. When, when the weight room ain't no bigger than this room right here. Okay, and that's a great question because, again, my, my roots, even though I played at Tennessee, my first job leaving Tennessee during this heyday, hope nobody else is in here, but during, that, during our prime tours at South Carolina State, I had two squat racks, two, squ um, two squat racks, Two inclines, two benches. All that being said, I knew I had to put this group together, this group together, that group together, and then from there dive into what each group was doing. Because like you said, if you got a group of guys that are just in there, they just want to be busy. So you hate to say it, but give them the busy work. Push-ups, sit-ups, pull-ups, whatever. For your base, for all your other sports, they can be doing the same thing, but now it's, rep, it's about the rep ranges. Who's doing what? Is the baseball team in season and the, back, and the football team's out of season? So now they can be doing the same thing, but two different rep schemes. And then with this sport, same thing. So you can keep it all uniform, but then from there, it's just knowing you all have got X, Y, Z. You all have got A, B, C. You all have got T, H, you know, H, I, J. Yes. Any other questions? Yes, sir. I have a question on work capacity. Yes. What would you recommend, uh, like, so say if you've got a person, let's say if you, almost like a smorgasbord like we had, like the Marvel age group, what would you recommend for uh, a proper work investment, like, to start the kids off on? Depending on, again, where they're coming from, what they've been exposed to. Scientifically, it's all about a three to one work ratio. But now you're also talking about the weather conditions. Where are we inside or are we outside? What part of the day are we in? Because early morning work is typically harder than later work. Science has shown that. So it's three to one, but don't be a hostage to that. You might have to use your coach's eye and say, okay, yeah, they need more time. Because if we're looking for a conditioning element, it's three to one, speed and high intensity work, five to one. But again, you can never go wrong with your coach's eye. Yes, sir. Yeah, you had drags and carries in one of your five exercise selections. Yes. You know, we only got 30 or 45 minutes. That's something that we often neglect. Could you just talk a minute on things you, reasons why you want to do drags and carries in one of your five main? So, dr your drags and carries, and we're talking about drags, sleds, tires, just carrying something because we're learning how to propel ourselves and move forward. Force application, learning how to strike the ground, but again, learning how to move coordinatedly with resistance. So that's why we always want to get our drags in. Carries is strictly for a, a vertical core training. And this is another subject that we could go in, but when we talk about core training, it's not crunches and sit-ups. Your core is making sure that everything is vertically aligned so that transition from upper to lower body. Talking about anti-rotation, anti-flexion, anti-extension. So it's not always about sit-ups and crunches and things like that, but we want to make sure that our body learns how to be a pillar when we're carrying farmer's carriers with two dumbbells, suitcase with one, carry, with one dumbbell, band holds overhead, whatever it may be, but just understanding how to move with resistance in a vertical position.
So if I got a 13 year old and I only got time for one core exercise, I'm not doing risk two, it's I'm doing function here. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Question yeah. on that. With periodization in your exercise selection, how how many do you try to hit out of those five categories per set necessarily, just an average? Again, depend on the time. Right. Um, but if it's an upper body day, because I do want to make sure we get some type of lift in, I mean some type of condition or movement in, then I want to make sure that I at least get two, one, like if it's a lower body day, a squat and a hinge. So that's a hip hinge, which is an RDL or a, a good morning, or a knee hinge with some type of leg curl. So one of the two, and then, like I said, we got to get some type of movement in. Same thing for the upper body. If I want to do a press and a pull, then for that fifth day, that's where the drags and the carries come in as a changeup. Yes, sir. Said you shouldn't go over six reps. Yes, and that's and again, you're talking about for high level athletes, but it's not just about the six reps as much as it is. Let me see something. Um, the optimal number. So let me get back to that slide. Thank you, sir. Um, um, that one right there. So when we talk about that optimal rep range, that that's just the recommended if you're doing if we're trying to get to 24, but stay within that 30. So yeah, you could get to, to you could do some tens, but again, when you're talking depending on that age range, ten is a very taxing number for some kids. So you're going to typically see technique breakdowns after six reps. That's the only reason we say limited to six. Yes, sir. We we are we're in a progressive overload. Uh, I'm sorry. We're in the 55 to 65 at least in January right now. Now you know it's February, so we're trying to add on more weight. I'm just trying to make sure. Should you be trying to overload each month? You know, by the time you hit try to hit that 90 percent range. No, so it. You don't hit that 90 all the time. So that, that's just like test of time, right? So yes. So let's go down to this slide. If we talk about periodization, let that be your goal. So if that's my, and I say because it's usually a down, a deload week, but if this is my goal, I need to work back to what's going to take me to get there. So if, you, like you said, if you're 55 to 60 percent right now, if we're saying we want to be at 90 percent here, we we can use our weeks, not just months. Within, you know, like we get four weeks in a month. Use those four weeks to transition to this one. Those four weeks there to transition this one. And it's not like you're going to want to start at 90 on the front end. That's probably going to be on the back end. So you've got plenty of time to get using your weeks more than a month. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, what are your thoughts on the snatch? I'm a big fan of clean and jerk, weight and force production, change, you know, change of direction, all that. Is, is the snatch. With a barbell, yes. If you get a broomstick or the PVC pipes, you can teach it effectively. But again, I say that Olympic lifts are extremely tough for any high school setting because they're so technical, and unless you have enough eyes to be able to teach it, you can miss something from the start if it's a power clean from the floor or even if it's a hang clean. Just so, you can miss something that quick. And so athletes need immediate feedback so that they don't try to just worry about the catch and how it's supposed to look without missing A, B, A, B C, D, D, all those things to get to that final point. But yes, I mean, you can teach it because they're, you know, you go through USAW weightlifting certification, they talk about those type of things. And to that point, I, they're certified high school strength coaches now. I would suggest that some of you all think about that to help alleviate some of the stress off of you all. Because again, you all put in so much time and effort in game planning and scouting and X, Y, Z, you know, you're teaching your class that the last thing that you can really do is to focus on this that requires a lot of time and effort, all right? I see any other hands. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, some athletes do like weightlifting, um, like competition weightlifting. And they're all about increasing their max and stuff. So how do you uh, go about doing that? 
Now, if you're talking about a true competitive weightlifting sediment setting, that's when we talk about that chronological age and training age. That's their primary intent. So they're getting all the work and rep and that they need. But now we go back to Prilipin's chart. We have to have so many sets and reps to make it look good because we're always looking for quality over quantity. That's why I say we don't want a long, extensive workout. Typically, a workout should be an hour and a half, 45 minutes inside, 45 minutes outside. Or even if you go two hours, hour inside, hour outside, it's got to be balanced. But you want to make sure that you're building within your main exercises. Use your secondary exercises to complement that, and that will enhance that main exercise. Because again, as you create more volume, you're also leading to more breakdown and micro trauma on the body. Any other questions? What you got on front squat, back squat, female and male athletes, and different types of Great question. I'm a firm believer in both of them, but it also comes with the caveat of being able to see it, what kind of person, what kind of squatter a person is. I would always recommend to start with a front squat because you can teach that core training and put them in a good squatting pattern. Whereas compared with a back squat, if a guy, if an athlete has a weak core, then they're gonna naturally want to be here. If they've got back, if they've got weak glutes, the first thing they're gonna do is valgus collapse, which is gonna put pressure on that ACL, start creating you know tendonitis and all other lower body injuries. We want to make sure that we're at least least able to stay vertical and then from there how the lower body moves because if you're talking about with basketball players with high femurs front squat is the way to go because they're always going to be longer down here than up top so it's just again knowing the, the knowing the population that you work with oh so so you said hour and a half yes all right Monday through Friday give me your breakdown of Monday through Wednesday Friday what, what would you so ideally, if we're on a four-day split, and now let's, let me back up and let me ask the great question. Am I, am I college or am I pro? Or high school? High school. High school athletes, I'm going to do a, on an upper body day, I'm going to do some type of conditioning after I lift. But even my lift, I'm going to do an upper body press and an upper body pull. <coughs> then I'm going to do some type of conditioning. All right, lower body day, I'm going to do some type of dynamic warm-up. So, again, we're addressing mobility, but then getting the body ready to go in and do some type of lower body squat and a posterior chain exercise. Again, that dynamic warm-up plus those two exercises is more than enough as you're building work capacity. Uh, day three, that's when we talk about our drags and our carries. That, that's our auxiliary day. We can do extra core work, extra grip work, extra shoulder mo mobi like mobility work, whatever. It doesn't have to be a hard day. Day four, we're going to go back to upper body. So now we're going to do another press, another pull. And, and when I say pulls, vertical pulls, horizontal pulls, because vertical pulls increase the width of your back. Horizontal pulls increase the thickness of your back. You want to make sure that you address both of those. Then, so we talked about the press, the pull, and now we, that's going to be our change direction day. Again, come to balance drills, learn how to change directions. Don't take it for granted. Slow it down, teach it to the athletes. Then go in and get that. Then from your lower, from your lower body day, now we're going to do some mobility work again. And then now this might be our, our single leg day because there are a lot of athletes that need the coordination to learn how to move single leg in different planes because that's what the game is. So that day two would be a single leg exercise day. So you, you want upper body, lower body, then the drag, and then upper body, lower body? Yes. Uh, so, because he, the way we were doing it was upper body, lower body, upper body, lower body, then the drag. Then we put the sled in and all that. So maybe the break in between might do some good. Right? Yes, because the body recovery is the number one tool for the body to adapt. If you do too much, it never gives your body never gets a chance to recover from the adaptation the stress that has been placed on it. So that 48 hours between that next exercise, that next lift is is very important. Any other questions? I know you run out of time on the nutrition side. How soon are you wanting your athletes at a high school level or at, you know, going to be able to put back in post workout? What's the window time? Within an hour. Within an hour. So. Um, protein shakes, milk, 
um, powders, anything. Like, as long as it's available for them, yes, make it available as soon as possible, but definitely within an hour. Yeah. Yes, sir. Go back to what you said about the pulls, about the vertical and horizontal pulls and what it does to your back. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? So, so from a mechanical standpoint, as we're put vertical pulls, that's, as we're coming down, that's what increases the width. But horizontal pulls are what increase the thickness. So that's why when we talk about doing inverted rows, barbell rows, or anything like that, we always want about we want to do more pulls than presses because we don't want to get this this complex. Everybody was so focused on bench pressing everything in front of our body, but what we know physiologically is that your go muscles, the most important muscle on the back side of your body. Your back protects your shoulders, then your hamstrings produce the speed and force production, as, long, as well as with your glutes. So we want to make sure we're training everything on the back side just as much, and really more than on the front side. Now, um, we've been talking about workouts, but power clean. Again, to my man's question about uh, not a in, high, in a high school setting. Okay. No, because I've seen personally with my own children when they come home. No, well, not just that, but all oh, this hurts, that hurts. Why are you hurt? What did you? And again, I have to respect you all as coaches, but from a professional standpoint, I'm gonna have something to say when my child comes home. This hurts. That. How did you get hurt in lifting? And then when I ask what well, he was doing, 75. Why, how do you know what his, how do you dictate a percentage if you don't have a max on him? So you have to, again, trust your coach's eye and be smart about what you're doing because of what, because of the, the, the population that you're working with and the, the needs for that sport. I mean, not the sport, but the exercise. That's a, Olympic lifts are extremely technical. There are college programs that don't Olympic lift for that reason. There are Olympic, there are NFL teams that don't Olympic lift for that reason. It's that technical that with the slightest movement, you can throw anything off in your body that can really be damaging to an athlete. Yeah, yeah, I saw you. You were talking about the front squat a minute ago. You were talking about how uh, some athletes are collapsing at the very bottom, the kind of knees going in. You said that was a glute issue. How would you fix something like that? One, we saw with the mini bands that you saw, we would just have them do mini band body weight squats. So now as they go down, they know how to push out on the band and they're, they're warming their glutes up. So they, they understand. But then too, just with a PVC pipe, keeping bands on, keeping a bar on your shoulders to be able to sit down and understand how to just sit down. Because if you tell an athlete to sit down in a chair, you'd be surprised how many of them would do this. I mean, seriously, like, we're laughing, but it's, but when you tell them that, no, I want you to sit with your butt back and reach, now they understand, oh, that's what, you, yes. So it's just, again, that I would start with the mini bands, second would be the PVC pipe, and then thirdly, you hate to say it and put it in, put it in this context, but just have them do a wall sit. That's the posture that you should be in, and that's why we say, going back to that question, the front squat is much more important than a back squat. Because I can put you in this, I can teach you this. I can't replicate a back squat without you back squatting. Yes, sir. Um, you were saying earlier, you said that uh, you, you don't recommend a, a back sit because when they get to the next level, the, the numbers aren't accurate. Yes. How about the, uh, what I do is the three rep backs, put in a calculator and, and calculate their numbers based off the three rep backs. Because I know the high school kid ain't going to be able to bench press properly 100% of their maximum. Wait, Correct. So, so as far as these three rep maxes, what, what, what are your thoughts on those? Three reps are a lot safer and a lot better than a true one rep and can be more accurate than a one rep or a five rep, excuse me, more accurate than a five rep, okay, because you're able to watch to see if they're able to control all, and I'm, and I'm looking at this because I'm thinking about terms of a squat. That's, for me, that's our most important exercise. If I can see somebody squat three reps the proper way, okay, then I know that that's a, that's a legitimate number. Similar question with the maximum. So I'm not gonna bring my kids in the first day of off season training and maximum. Right? Mm-hmm. So it's gonna be a little bit different. Um, 
Absolutely. I'm not going to give you percentages. I don't know what percentages to work off of. I'm going to give them a load to this start losing technique. How many weeks until you do match, you get a number so you can start losing percentages? Okay, so let me make sure I understand this right. You're wanting to know how long before you get to a point where you can use percentages? Right, so I'm going to tell a kid to put, put a 10 on each side and then increase the weight until you start losing technique. Yes. And don't go any higher. Because I don't know what he can do. I'm, I'm not thinking of him 75%. And he doesn't have off what max. So after how many weeks of that would you do something like that until you can max to get a maximum number? Typically eight weeks. Because even in a, it takes your body four to six weeks to respond to an exercise. And at that point where it's almost time to change, where you know that by that time you should have everything from a movement pattern standpoint to be able to handle a decent load. And I say decent, you know, but it's all subjective on our eyes, but that they can handle something that, to my man's question, that they can handle for three reps. Because five reps, seven, ten, all those are, now those become guessing games. But three reps are a lot more accurate than trying to put somebody under bar for one rep. Do you do you do that every eight weeks? Yes. So, one more thing, when he said, so our, our program doesn't, doesn't really start until, let's say, January. And that first phase is eight weeks. So what? And so what he said? How fast? You said take eight weeks before you get your first max. Yes. We're going into phase two after our first eight weeks. Yes. So so, um, what 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 I do and, and help me out help me out here. So what I do, we we do max the first week when I get I get height and weight measurements and everything and give them a max, but it's a light max. It's a it's a work up. So let's say let's say we have a. Uh, 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 11th grade who's already been weight training, yes. and then we, we put a light amount, and we let him work up so that we, we you know, a gradual work up, not, not, not anything heavy. So that's where we get our base max, and then after that eight weeks, after we, um, after we, we deload, we get another max. And then we, our, then their max is higher. So now that 55% that they started out with is, is, is higher than their first 55%. You see what I'm saying? Yes. So that initial max, you're, um, I, I, th I think that's a very valuable stepping stone uh, or start point. And then you're saying we should... That's not recommended. Well, and I, and, and I say it's not recommended because, again, going back to training age and chronological age, a ninth grader who's just getting to your program, this is their first year in high school, too. Now, remember, you're looking at a cumulative effect. They've got other stressors besides training. What's going on at home? What's going, you know, how's this person eating? Is he playing another sport? If you're talking about fresh off the block, you know, and I know most of you all get two weeks for a break. What have they done for those two weeks to make, to be, to physically be ready to train again, to come in here talking about trying to max? That's when you increase that risk of guys getting, of athletes being injured. So, and, and again, you all have the benefit of however long the semester is, using all of that time. It's not that you have to necessarily max every eight weeks. You, you know, and I get it. Every, some athletes are two sport, three sport athletes. You got a lot of things pulling on these athletes that, that creates other stresses that for the time that they're with you is not going to make them the best version training wise of themselves. So you always have to consider the external stressors as well. Yes, sir. Kind of uh, going what they said. We do like a two to four week girl introduction phase when they get back and kind of do like a lot of assessments. Do you have any like pre-test assessments that you think are beneficial to see like when they should progress onto a barbell? Yes, and that's a great question. One, starting with our squat, like just a barbell squat, we'll just have them do just that. A five rep, three second eccentric barbell squat, because that also lets us know from a conditioning standpoint what their lower body looks like, but then even from a posture standpoint, what their core strength is like. A 60, uh, and I say 60 second, but a, a plank position. How long can they hold that? And then we do some other shoulder ex some other shoulder exercise as far as laying on the ground doing Y holes, T holes, push up tests. You know, because just because the thumb on a bench press is not going to do us anything. We're not training for exercise. We're training for sports. 
And so that's something that we always want to emphasize too. What's going to make you the best athlete, not just good at doing this exercise? Yes, sir. Do you have an effective way for uh, athletes to gain weight? The most effective way, and I, and I say this jokingly, they've got to eat. I mean, I, and we deal, with, again, we professional athletes that won't eat. It's hard to get them to do that and hard for them to understand it, but that's when the importance of messaging and teaching them that your body is your car. One of the things we use, with even with our nutritionists, is you think about a gas tank. You know, when we started to show them, when that car goes, that, that, as that, you know, that needle goes down, that thing hits empty, you know, now you start getting that check engine light. You get this, you get all these warning signs, same thing with your body. You want to keep it as fuel as possible by eating enough to make sure that you can st sustain your development without putting you back into a catabolic or a break, breaking down state. Guys, I'm going to step in and interject. We've got a real break right now, about 10 minutes over. I don't want to stop the conversation. Y'all keep talking, ask questions. We're going to break back up with uh, section two, 215. So you got 15 minutes. Get out, all that stuff, whatever you do, we'll crank back up. Okay, no, no problem. You keep talking. Yeah, and I'll be around if anybody wants to talk. Good, how you doing?